Hello, everybody, and welcome to our live event on March 25th here. My name is Dave Solberg. I'm the managing editor of the RV Repair Club, and uh, I see we already got quite a few people that have joined our chat and then quite a few questions in here. Uh, hopefully, you've had a chance to kind of bring the uh, your RVs out of mothballs. We've had some pretty good weather here the last week. I've seen a few... Hello, everybody, and welcome to our live Ooh, event on March 25th. I probably should mute my... Uh, the hey, how's that working for me? RV Repair Club, and uh, I see we already got quite a few people that have joined our chat and quite a few questions in here. Uh, hopefully, you oh, had a chance on. to kind of bring the uh, your RVs out of mothballs. We've had some people <laughs> here the last week. I've seen a few. Oh, to our there we go. See what happens when my granddaughter's not here to help me with all this stuff. Amazing. I brought this up so I could take a look at my questions, and so now. I got to make sure we got it muted and I can get back to my live answers here. Where am I? Um, we, there we go. All right. Sorry about that. So like I was saying, the weather's been nice. I've seen a lot of, um, not a lot, but a few shows of some of the South Carolina shows uh, were, were actually uh, going on. There were quite a few people out there itching to get out and see the RVs, but um, it's time to bring the RVs out and, and start looking at... Uh, uh, getting them ready, dewinterizing, and so forth. I uh, just want to put out, we uh, do have our, uh, the RV Money Saving Secrets is available for download, and it's uh, learn how to save money on gas, um, get free camping, meal planning, save money on uh, different types of meals. So a uh, great source of uh, information, some great tips. So go to the website to download that. So let's get started with our first question. Jim has a 1960. Uh, 1916. That's an old RV. Has a 2016 Thor Tuscany EXT. What caulking do you use for to recock the seams where the overlay comes together at the exterior of the coach? That's a good question, Jim. We've uh, covered a lot of this in some of the classes and and videos online, but I'm glad you brought this up because you don't want to use just any run of the mill silicone or sealant that you can get at a, at a home improvement store. It needs to be specific to the material that is on your coach. Now, this happens to be one here that we got for fiberglass and it's called 311 RV and it's designed exclusively for the fiberglass cap and the fiberglass skin of a Winnebago um, RV because they use fiberglass on theirs. But you'll want to You'll want to check with what type you have. Uh, you could have uh, you could have the uh, EPDM, which is this stuff, like from Dicor, and that would take a different kind of, of a sealant. Um, there's TPO, which uh, Dicor calls theirs Diflex here, but TPO is a, a version of the rubber membrane with some reinforcement in it. There's aluminum, so you, you've got to identify the component that you have, and then I would suggest either looking at Dicor uh, or RV dealership. Um, one other thing that a lot of people like to use is a turnabond, and that's a pretty catch-all. This stuff is just amazing how, how sticky it is and how resilient it, it stays on. Um, the big thing, though, no matter what you use is, like we've said many, many times, is get up, inspect that, that sealant that's already on there, um, if you've got a lot of wavy areas, and this stuff is a self-leveling, you can uh, see that uh, right here, self-leveling, which means when you put it on that seam, it's going to even out. It's just going to put a nice bead across there. You don't have to go in and, and uh, smooth it out. Um, you don't want to use this on a vertical seam. You're going to have to use a, a non-leveling on that one. Um, but uh, you want to make sure you clean it up really well. And if you got a lot of cracks, you got a lot of pull apart areas, a lot of dirt, clean it really well. You may even have to take some of the old silicone or sealant off of that area just to get a nice surface to put this or the Eternabon uh, or whatever sealant you're using. So find out what material you've got. And you could, you could tell if you want to uh, get in with the uh, TPO and the EPDM, you will see that all the EPDM stuff no matter what the outside or the you know the top coating color is, inside will be black, like this. So they, they actually color this, um, either tan or white or th this one happens to be beige. And the way you, you can tell this is go inside and you'll have a roof vent somewhere in your bathroom or your living room. Just take the shroud off of that roof vent, it's just a few screws, and you'll see a lot of extra of this stuff kind of tucked in around that. They just put a big X and they cut 
the excess out so you'll be able to see the back side. If it's the same color as the front, then it's the TPO or the die flex like they have here. Same with this one, but if it's one color here but black, it's EPDM. Okay, so Kelly Foster says, the aluminum siding on my Viking Ultralight has come unstapled at the bottom edge along the front of the trailer. I was thinking of screwing a strip of one inch wide, uh, eighth inch thick aluminum to the bottom edge to hold it and reinforcement force it. Is this a good idea? Is there a better way to do this? You could do that. Um, one of the things, you know, without seeing it, I don't know how much damage is in there or moisture has might it might have gotten in there. You definitely want to make sure you're not getting moisture from the top, you know, flowing down the inside of that front cap and making its way out the bottom, rotting that wood or whatever is at the bottom part of it. Something else that, that I see a lot of people doing, and I've done this on several trailers in the past, is I put about a foot thick piece of diamond plate, it's called. You can get it at um, Home Depots. You can get it at you know, almost any home improvement stores. Um, you, know, you can get it online, but it's just, it's a good, uh, fairly thick protective plate. So not only is it going to hold that uh, in place that you've got started to, to loosen up, but it's also going to give you kind of a rock shield area to keep anything from flying up and doing any more damage on that front skirt and moisture too. That's a big thing. Seal it really well first. You know, maybe put a, a Eternabon, you know, bottom and top on that corner edge, get a nice seal so you don't get any moisture penetration coming up inside because it's going to wick in there and then it's going to start to rot uh, the inside of your, your uh, front wall of, of that unit. Uh, we have... Andrew Powers has an E2 weight distribution hitch with sway bars. It just came out of winter hibernation and is creaking and growing, groaning uh, pretty loudly. Should I lubricate any part of this system to eliminate the noise? And what I would recommend, I'm not familiar with the E2. It might be a Campco uh, version of it, but they do have some uh, recommendations on the type of lubrication, whether it's a white lithium. Uh, most of the time where you're going to get the, the squeaking and the groan, it, a groaning is at the hitch itself because you've got metal on metal and as that starts to wear it's going to start to get rusty it's going to start to get some sharp points in it and you will you will get some squeaking in there so um, you know they do recommend a variety of different things some of them recommend fluid film this is a product that is a rust inhibitor and it's a great lubrication um, and and the big thing about that I like about fluid film is the fact that it will not swell any rubber seals or components. So any, and, and usually won't have that in a weight distribution hitch, but you know, when you start using WD-40 and other silicones, if you've got any rubber seals or gaskets, those will typically swell those up and eventually ruin them. This, this will not. But I would check with the manufacturer. You got the hitch to the, the ball. Uh, you've got your pivot points where your bar comes up, and I'm not sure if that E2 has a chain or a, a literal... Uh, cradle that it sits in. That's another spot where you're going to get some movement and some wear and tear out of it. So um, there are some points. There are manufacturers that do recommend certain lubrications to those. Just get that brand and like I say, go to the, either your owner's manual or the website and it should tell you what they recommend because there's a lot of product out there and uh, where they recommend or how often they recommend to lubricate it. <clears throat> um, so we have Joe, then, let me scroll down a little bit here. How do you change LED marker lights outside the trailer? I have four lights across the top of the trailer, and two do not work. So the first thing I would do, you know, typically those, those marker lights are just going to be held on with a couple screws with a wire coming to the back, and usually daisy-chained with a 12-volt wire um, that, that goes in there. If you have two of them that's not working, I would first of all make sure that it's it's not the wiring versus the socket that is not working because if you put new LEDs in and the wiring is crimped somewhere, um, they're not going to work anyway. The other thing I would do is, is so your your your, uh, your current halogen lights um, or incandescent, whatever you've got, are just pretty much two screws. You take the lens cap off and you'll see a couple screws that are just holding them in place. You should be able to pull those off and have two wires. And the thing that I would be very, very careful about is uh, making sure 
you'd know which wire is positive and which wire is negative. And that might sound kind of simple, but I have seen in cases where, um, let's take for example, Winnebago, they wire, uh, all their 12 volt wiring is either purple or green. It's not the typical red and black like you would expect a 12 volt wiring, it's purple and green. So now all of a sudden you got this two wires and which one's positive and which one's negative. And the guy on the line, when the unit runs down, he grabs the two wires, he puts them onto a light socket and it works. And with uh, incandescent, it doesn't matter how you wire it. You know, you could have positive to the bottom and negative to the side and it would turn on. You can re reverse them and it will turn on. All it is is resistance and, and it glows that wire. Some of your LED lights are very, very polarity specific. So I would get a multimeter and, you know, you don't even have to do this. You just something as simple as a light tester and ground one end and find out which one's the positive, which one's the negative. So you know that you're hooking those up um, in, the correct, in the correct way. But you should be able to just take two screws off, pull that light socket off, test that wire to make sure the wire's good, and then shut your power off and install your LED lights um, just like normal. Ah, Iris Jan Ole, maybe. I can't get my refrigerator to work in my pleasure way. So anytime you have an appliance like a refrigerator, something that works on both electric and propane, what we always start with is, does it work on one mode versus the other? Try it in both different applications. So I plug it into a 120 volt source. I try to see if it, if, if it starts, if, if I get monitor panel stuff and if it cools. Uh, if it doesn't, then I try it on the LP side of it. And so let's, let's look at the fact that you can't get it to work on either mode, um, LP or uh, 120 volt power. The first thing I, I would look at is you have to have a 12 volt source to run your, your refrigerator, whether you're running on propane or electric. Check the uh, fuse. You should have a little automotive type fuse down in the distribution panel. Um, you, you would go back to the monitor board and the backside of the refrigerator and check that you got 12 volt coming in because that's what runs your monitor board inside, your eyebrow, your eyebrow board inside. Um, if you don't have 12 volt power, then you have to find out backtrack where, where am I, where am I missing this? Um, the other thing is, is, is then, is it turning on? It's just not getting cool. Um, and so you should be able to diagnose the fact that, okay, I've got, I've got 120 volt power. I've got the circuit breaker is, is engaged. I have power to the refrigerator, but nothing comes on. Then it's pretty much the monitor board is, is the problem. It's not getting to that. You can take the cover off. There is an inline fuse in there. Um, I guess I would recommend taking a look at some of the uh, videos we have online. We spent a lot of time on those refrigerators. We did an entire class on the refrigerators and walked through those steps, showing you how to test those those things. Now, if it's if it, if the you do have power coming to it, but it's just not cooling, then you have to go through the steps again. Is it doing it on electricity versus LP. If I have one that cools really good on electricity and it doesn't do it on LP, then I start looking at, am I getting uh, good gas pressure? Um, the way you can tell that is you turn your stove on inside and you light the first burner and you should get a nice blue flame. And then when you light the second burner, you'll see a little jump in the flames, but it should settle back down with a nice blue flame about the same size. Run your third one. If you have a three-way, um, a three-burner a three burner range top, and you know, make sure that the, the regulator is supplying enough LP pressure to that unit. And if it starts jumping around and flickering a little bit or orange, um, you know, then you got a regulator problem. So if that's okay, the next thing that you would look at is do I get spark when I go to try and light it up LP? Do I get uh, do I get a click? I hear the valve open. I have a gas is coming to the burner assembly. Do I hear a spark? Do I hear it trying to light? And if I don't have a spark, then I've got a problem with my electrode or probably more important, my, my panel. It'll only try it so many times and, and then it will shut off. So you're not just pouring gas into, you know, raw gas into your RV for a long period of time. Same way with the spark. If the spark's going and it doesn't ignite, you could have a clogged burner assembly. So you're not getting enough gas through and, um, the, too much air and so then it, it won't light as well so you're looking for a flame 
that uh, when you're we're running it on LP, if that flame starts, there's a little peephole that you can pull open on the back side. Outside, you open up the uh, vent cover, and you'll see a little box, and there should be a little peephole. There should be a flame burning a nice blue. If you're not, then you, again, you got to back up through uh, those. So, um, you know, that, that that's kind of an overview, generic, but you got to go through those steps and find out, you know, which way it's doing and then be able to provide a little more information as you get to a certain point. Is, is it cooling for a little while and, and not, or just nothing at all? There's a lot of different scenarios. So, Bill Austin said battery upgrade replace with wet acid, glass, or lithium. Um, so there are, you know, the, the standard in house batteries, um, and, and we're looking for deep cycle batteries because they're going to be drained and replenished and drained and replenished many, many times called cycles. Uh, the standard is the um, acid, lead acid batteries, and they work very fine. You know, it's just that they take a little more maintenance. You have to have a multi-stage um, converter that has uh, a desulfation because that's a big problem with batteries is every time you drain the energy out of a battery sulfur attacks the cells the plates in your batteries and coats them and the more you let that do it and the more cycles you go without breaking up that sulfur on there they get sulfate and then they lose their capacity and that's been a big problem with lead acid so everybody goes well I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to, to uh, glass mat or I'm gonna go to um, Lithium batteries because you know th th they last longer. Well, they they have less maintenance required on them. So the next step up is um, you know there's gel batteries are out there for a while, but we don't see much of those anymore. Absorbed glass mat is AGM batteries, and they are a completely sealed system. They literally have fiberglass mats in with the cells of the plates on the inside, and they have less sulfation. They still have some, but they have less sulfation. So the, the idea with those is that they, they last longer, meaning they provide more amp hours like they're supposed to. So you've got an absorbed glass mat, or excuse me, you've got a lead acid battery that's, say, a group 24, and you should get about 100 amp hours out of that thing. And, you know, within a year or two years, you don't even get a day out of them. And that's because they have sulfated to the point where you're not getting enough storage of energy. And that's what you're looking for, storage of energy in there and they look like they're charged they're 12.4 and it's like yeah they're great or 12.6 and all of a sudden you go out and boom boom right away they just drop and so um you know if you're going to upgrade and you're looking at the wet cell batteries i would definitely get a multi-stage charger from like parallax or progressive dynamics they have their charge wizard something that does a desulfation stage so it does kind of a high output front and it boils and it breaks up that sulfation then it goes through an um, equalizing stage and a, um, um, a float charge. The step up then would be to go to AGM batteries, which require less of that, but you're probably doubling the price when you're doing that. And it really all boils down to how much dry camping do you need to do, meaning not plugged into a campground source so your, your converter can, can keep charging those batteries. And uh, you know, cause that's, the, that's the expensive part of it. If you want to go to lithium ion, lithium ion is very, very expensive. It's starting to become the new rage uh, that people want to get in, especially with the smaller class Bs and Cs, because they don't they don't have the storage for this massive battery bank. But they are five, six, seven times the money, and you really need to to, or you have to have the need for a lot of amp hours to justify using something like that and dry camping. So those are kind of the generations. If you do go with lithium, make sure you get the charger that is designed for lithium batteries. You can't just swap lithium in with your distribution center unless it has a charging system or converter, they call that, um, that can, can handle those lithium batteries and charge them the way they're, they're supposed to. Otherwise, you just wasted money. You're going to charge them to a certain percent. They're going to have less capacity than they're supposed to, and you just threw a whole bunch of money down the drain. Okay, so next question, we've got David Royer. How can I add two new 110-volt outlets to the rear of my 2000 Dutch Star 38-foot motorhome? So, um, you know, the, the electrical outlets in your RV are very similar to the ones in your home. They've got Romex that runs to it. They start at the distribution center with a circuit breaker 
Um, did I bring that with me? I think I have one somewhere here. Did I take it outside? Is it up front? Hmm. I didn't think I put that thing away. Oh, here it is. Good. Okay, so this is going to be a, a you know a typical distribution center. This is all in one, so I'm not sure if yours is uh, has the converter here and a separate one, but you'll have circuit breakers through all these, and so one of these breakers is set up for your electrical outlets, and most of the time it's one circuit doing all the outlets. They call that gang. So the, you you have a Romex that goes from here to the first outlet on the one side, on the second side of the outlet, then another Romex goes to the next one. And usually those are all routed either uh, in the wall, they, they route the, the um, insulation in the wall and embed that in there or down underneath the floor. So if you wanna add two outlets to the back of it, you gotta find somewhere where you have a outlet that you can gang to from maybe back in the, in the bathroom area. Um, Actually, I probably wouldn't do the bathroom because that's going to be GFCI protected. Or you can come in and do your own extra. You can add, as you can see, a couple stations in here, add an extra one and run Romex back and do the two in the back. I would definitely put it in some kind of a conduit, shield it, see if you can get it through the basement. Or, like I say, daisy chain, something that's already, already back there. But very, very similar to what you would have in your home. Okay. Oops. A little too far. So Jeff M, thoughts on reducing the roll on class A in corners. Bring us down just a little bit. So Mark, Jeff's asking, how do you reduce the roll on class A when you go around the corners? And the first thing I would do is I would go weigh the RV, find out where you're at, not only the gross vehicle weight rating, meaning the overall weight of the RV, but where you're at on each one of the axles. Um, you know, there's a company out in the market called RV Safety and Education Foundation that has been weighing coaches for probably about 30 years now. And still they're finding that um, almost 50% of the RVs out in the market are overloaded or have underinflated tires in some capacity. It might not be overall, it might be just the front, just the back. Anytime you put maximum weight or go over maximum weight on that, you're really taxing that chassis system and that suspension to, to you know, make it perform the way it was designed to. Second thing is I would check your tire inflation. Make sure you got proper tire inflation and it's not just what's on the sidewall of that unit. You gotta weigh the coach, find out the weight, on each individual tire and then look at the tire chart and put it according to that. The next thing that I would look at is, um, you know, st the, the chassis suspension itself. And I've spent a lot of time with Safety Plus, Roadmaster. There's several of them out in the market. I, I do like both Safety Plus and Roadmaster because they, they have the philosophy that they want to make sure that you have all your components are working the way they're supposed to before they put their product on because if you have shocks that are starting to get weak or you have your front suspension, your shackles, your, your bushings are starting to get weak, you throw an aftermarket suspension system on and you're just band-aiding the problem. So they go in and they check to make sure, you know, if you have leaf springs in the front, if you have a Ford chassis, um, you know, when you say class A, you know, is it, is it gas or is it diesel? Um, and, and again, the year too. Um, you know, I would say probably up to about 1990, 293, um, you know, the, the chassis suspension on these was pretty weak. It was, we called them elephant on roller skates. So you had a lot of slopping around in them. So uh, we sold a lot of aftermarket products like uh, the jet suspension was back then. Moride has a good suspension. Three, uh, the uh, Roadmaster and the Safety Plus. So first thing I would look at is your shocks. Make sure your suspension is up. Right, well, again, first things, weight tires. Then I would look at the suspension of that system, make sure get underneath it, uh, maybe take it to somebody. In fact, I just had one of the guys that I, I worked with um, for a few years, an accountant, he just bought 
a Winnebago, it was actually, actually an Itasca, and I went over and did a walk around, looked at it, helped him inspect it. And uh, one of the things when I was out driving it, I just felt a little bit of a, a movement in, in the, it just felt a little, a little sloppy. And this is probably a 2016 unit. And so I told him, I said, you know, before I bought this, I would take it over to a chassis specialist. We have a Ford dealer locally that handles the Winnebago stuff um, in Itasca. And before I bought it, I would have him do an inspection with it and talk to the dealer and who he, he was buying it from um, an, an auto, a used auto car shop that goes, they, you know, they get the, the auction cars and stuff like that. And I said, they don't know suspension. They don't know anything about this RV. They took it in on trade for, um, you know, Autom automobile or something like that and he took it over to the Ford dealership and there was a couple items in there that uh, the shocks well one of the shocks was bent and so anyway I would check those components first then look at something like you know Roadmaster uh, Safety Plus or um, Moride okay Carrie said what is the best RV water pump and uh, over the many, many years that I've RVing, been RVing, the best water pump is one that works. <laughs> it seems like that. That seems pretty simple. But I've always been a big fan of SureFlow. Um, you know, Winnebago has used it for many, many years. And it's changed hands a couple times. It's not the same company it was. But the newer models are very quiet. They have a lot better flow rate into them. I think this one right now is three gallons per minute, that's pretty close to what your residential uh, system's gonna run. You might get some households that could do four gallons a minute in, in here. And they do have a little bit of a, of a larger flow rate on these, but they're very, very quiet. It used to be they'd start up and and uh, they, they're, they're pretty much whisper now. Um, Flowjet is another company that um, you know I have done some work with when I did National RV and We've uh, put a couple of pumps in some units, and, and, and I see a lot of companies are starting to use that. So I, I wouldn't be afraid of, of either, either one of those two. But you want to get the gallons per minute, you know, up to three at least, maybe four. Um, and I know SureFlow has their, their Whisper Jet, which is, is uh, you know, you can hardly even hear it. So those are the ones I would recommend. Um. How can I add two on our, I think we just did that. Uh, is there any way to tie into the generator? Okay, so David Royer comes back with a second question on uh, his 38 foot motorhome. Is there any way to tie into the generator? And, and there, it, it, there's no way to do that because your generator is gonna have two outlets. It's got two circuit breakers. One is a 30 amp, the second is a 20 amp, uh, depending on the size. I guess I'm, 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 I'm assuming with this one, you got a 38 footer. You might have 250s coming off that, but uh, they go into a uh, automatic transfer switch and then they go into the distribution center. So there's no place on the actual generator that, that you can tie into those because they're going to the distribution center. You, you would have to go up to there or gang from the, the back side of it. Joe says, are trailer king tires really that bad? Well, <clears throat> You know, there's a lot of discussion out in the market about Trailer King, uh, Chinese tires, all these kind of cheap tires that are out there. And, and one of the things that we're seeing, um, you know, I would really recommend if you want to do some research on tires, go to the RV Safety and Education Foundation's website. It's called rvsafety.com. And they have worked with all the tire manufacturers. In fact, there's very few tire manufacturers anymore that aren't building some tires in China, whether they're Goodyear's or... Firestones or whatever you have a, a, that's out there. Um, Trailer King has gotten a, a pretty bad reputation from what I see in the forums and people talking about them. And one of the one of the things that I, I have found is that you know the, the tires sometimes are getting a bad rap because of what we as consumers are doing to them. Um, we did a lot of research when I was at Winnebago working with Michelin and Goodyear. And the RV Education Foundation actually got its start by John Anderson, who had a fifth wheel and kept blowing out tires. And after they replaced a variety of different tires on his brand new RV, they brought it in and weighed the coach. And he was overloaded with that coach uh, pretty substantially. 
but back then nobody had any weight ratings. Nobody told you what you could put in. You have all these massive compartments all over this RV. You think you can fill them up with everything that's out there, and that's not the case. You have to know your weight ratings, and you have to know what, what your RV weighs. And so John did an education. He started weighing coaches called Away We Go. That was his first step. And he found about 75% of all RVs had overloaded uh, tires and underinflated tires. And so he got the manufacturers, you know, grudgingly to put the weight of that RV because, you know, you got these guys putting in Corian and tile and all this stuff in that weighs a, a ton. And then they're putting it on a lighter weight chassis because that chassis costs less money. I can do an 18,000 pound GVW chassis or I can go up to 22,000. You're talking maybe 10 grand in the difference of price in that thing. And so if you've got a lot of price leaders that were in the market back then, and, and there's still a little bit of that now, not, not as much, but um, you know, so you, you could you get two units sitting side by side and this one is at 18 and this one's at 22, but you know, they don't tell you that. They just say, well, you, you're buying that, that one is more expensive because it's a Winnebago or it's more expensive because it's a Newmar. Well, Winnebago had a philosophy that if we're going to build this coach and we're going to put all this stuff in it, we're not going to have it at the point where you only have 200 pounds of carrying capacity before you go over the weight rating. And there, there was, there was quite an education that had to be brought out to the, to the public by, by Winnebago and by Newmar and some of these other companies that said, you know, that there is a difference in price for a reason. You have to decide how much stuff you're going to take. Same thing with trailers. If I can, I can buy a trailer that has 2,500 pound axles, 3,500 pound axles, 5,000 pound axles. All that means I can carry more stuff. I can put more, thing in, more things in there and you have to decide if that's important to you. So, you know, the, the thing about these tires is that when you see 50% of the RVs out in the market have overloaded, overloaded chassis, those tires aren't gonna stand it. And then we leave the tires, we don't check the pressure. Um, you know, again, about 50% of the tires out in the market are underinflated. So if you don't have proper inflated tires, even 10 PSI less, and recommended pressure, you're reducing your carrying capacity by 25%. And then we let them sit out in storage and out in the parking lots and in the, in the campgrounds exposed to sun, and there's tire rot, there's weather checking. And so I have seen some horrible things with tires that people just aren't taking care of them. And so you get the cheaper tires and, and you see them, you know, and, and back in the days when we were first starting, when just before I left Winnebago, um, the, 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 Discussion at the campground was I got to get rid of those Michelins and I got to buy Coopers and I heard it from my folks They came back from a, a rally from a, a caravan one time and they said oh we got to get rid of these Cooper these uh, These Michelins now the Michelins aren't the problem. The problem is is you're not checking your tires and Michelin had 80% of the new market so when they have this mass of, of tire failures or low low inflation they, the, the, you know, everybody blames the Michelins. And so they go out and they buy these, you know, four ply, five ply, six ply Coopers on there. And they're not having quite, you know, cause nobody's gonna go out and buy a Michelin that they already had problems with because of the price of them when they think that that's the problem. So they go to these Coopers and you're masking the problem. Now all of a sudden we're seeing axles, we're seeing brakes and other issues because of the weights. So I don't know that the tire King is actually that bad of a tire if you take care of the tire. But the challenge that we have in today's world is we don't have thousands and thousands of people that are taking care of their tires, posting on the internet that they were wonderful tires and I never have problems. We have all the people that have the problems and oh. So I, I guess that's, that's a long way around the answer uh, of that. But you know, if you take care of your tires, if you make sure you can, you. Uh, you check your weights of them. Don't let them dry rot. You know, I know a lot of people have had success with that tire. And so, uh, you know, that's, I guess that's the long answer of that. <clears throat> okay. Um, Corey says, I have a 31 foot class A Winnebago with no inverter. What's the best or the easiest way to add one? Right now I have to plug my 30 amp power to a plug to use the generator and plug, unplug and plug into the AC for 120 volt power. 
Also, is there an electric switcher so I don't always have to switch the plug for what I am using? <clears throat> okay, so he has a 31-foot Class A with no inverter. What's the easiest? Right now, I have to plug my 30-amp power to a plug to use the generator, and I'm plugging to use my AC for 120. Okay, so the... Um, what he's what he's saying is that he, he he's got a shoreline power and in his 31 foot motorhome he has to plug into the campground source to be able to use the air conditioner run so if he wants to run his generator he has to unplug from that and plug it into what we call a j box so he's got two boxes pretty much in his service center if i'm reading this right it's probably an older an older unit um that was the old style and i don't know they might still be doing that but um most of the manufacturers that have a generator on board have gone to what's called a J uh, automatic transfer switch, AT, ATS. And what that is, is you, you hook your generator, uh, your shoreline uh, power can go into uh, the campground source, but your generator is wired direct to this automatic transfer switch, ATS. And so you start up the generator, that box senses your generator is on it's supplying the power and and it will it will switch it over for you automatically so you don't have to take it out and and put it back in that that is totally separate of an inverter um, that is that is how you switch your power you want to do it manually or do you want to do it automatically so then the inverter what you need to do with that is you need to determine what size inverter you need uh, there's a lot of market um, uh, I know that uh, some of the solar companies like GoPower has their own inverter, Parallax, Progressive Dynamics. Um, you know, I, I would I would say you you want to kind of stick with an inverter that's been part of the RV industry. Don't just go down to some of the discount tool stores and because they look cheap because that's what they are. They're very cheap. They they won't last. And that inverter is going to hook into your battery bank. And so again, it has nothing to do with the generator and the electrical system other than the converter that's in there is, is gonna be, you know, if you get a big enough inverter, that's gonna be your charger for your batteries. But that inverter then is gonna take and take 12 volt power and provide you with 120 volt power, but you're not gonna be able to use an air conditioner. You won't have that much. Um, and it all is gonna be limited to how much battery power you have or amp hours. So you can't just put a gen a, a inverter in with and, and I know with the Winnebago, that 31 footer, you probably get two 12 volt batteries in them, but you're not going to, that's, that's not going to last very long for dry camping. If you're trying to use the inside stuff. And again, you will not be able to use your air conditioner with an inverter pulling off those batteries. That's got to be the electrical system. So hopefully that walked you through that a little, a little better. <clears throat> okay. So. Bert says, I have a discovery in 1998. Where can I find the fuse for the windshield wipers? So the windshield wipers are technically going to be part of your chassis fuse system. And with a discovery, I'm not exactly sure. A lot of them were putting them um, out in the front. If, if you can drop the front down, there's, there's sometimes a fuse panel on that front firewall. Uh, that discovery is going to be a, a diesel pusher, so it's very possible. There's a, the, the, you know, there's several places they put fuses over the years, and and I don't know every single one of them, but um, a lot of the diesel pushers, especially Fleetwood, up in the underneath the driver's compartment outside, there was a door that would open up and have a full array of uh, fuses in there. Some of them had them in the back where you had your um, um, your, your batteries that were close for the, for the start batteries on your chassis. And then a few of them, like Winnebago, put them under the dash. So your dash would lift up and you, you saw a fuse block in there. I don't know if that Discovery did it. I know the Bounder um, was doing that because they had the flip-up dash first. So those are some areas that, that I would check and see. And if anybody out there has a Discovery and has come through that, please post this or uh, you know help, help, uh, help them out. Bert, I guess it is. So Keith asks, uh, he's got a 2020 F53 V10, which is the Ford. When driving at lower speed, the chassis air blows at the vent in, in the low 50s. However, at highway speed, the chassis air blows in the 60s. Can this be resolved? That, uh, okay. 
at highway speeds, the chassis, air. So I'm, I'm assuming when you say the chassis air, probably the, the heater or the vent, which is going to be an aftermarket product that is, is uh, put on um, typically by the RV manufacturer. And I don't, I don't know if Ford went into uh, putting their own uh, heating and cooling system in. They might have done that. I, I know for a long time they were, they were doing aftermarket stuff. So um, that one is that one is a little challenging for for what I uh, I don't know why you would get 50 degrees and I'm assuming it's on the heat side of it. You know I've seen just the opposite where you go at a lower speed and you get you get a better um, better temperature out of it, and then when you get the higher speed you get more air. There's air leaks in that front um, firewall or hosing um, the the housing component and the cold air gets in and and dilutes at it at the higher speeds. But, uh, you know, I, I would I would guess it has to do something with the RPM. Uh, then if you're getting into the higher speeds and the higher RPM, and, and maybe if you can document that, just look and see is there a difference in the RPMs that you're, you're getting that with. And then uh, I would I would say you probably need to get in touch with either, and you didn't say what, um, what manufacturer it is other than the chassis is Ford. It, it could possibly be an aftermarket heating assembly. So I would check with the RV manufacturer first and just find out is it a Ford or is it a, a uh, you know, the motorhome builder in it. And, uh, you know, it's got to be tied, tied somehow to the RPM is the only thing I can think of because um, I, I've never heard of that. And that's something I, I can say often sometimes. It's just it's amazing. Every day you get up and you all of a sudden you get a question, you go, wow. I've been doing this since 1983, so new stuff comes in all the time. Uh, when towing a fifth wheel toy hauler with the garage empty, it tows without any chucking. But when the garage is loaded, we get moderate chucking. We travel with the tanks mostly empty. Could we fill the fresh water tank to put more weight on the pin to eliminate the chucking? And we call that highway hop or whatever. And, and, and you know, two things happen when you get too much weight on the back end or improper weight distribution is you either you get what's called highway hop, which you I think is what you're chucking is, or you get swaying. And what you need to do is get in and actually weigh that coach at a cat scale. Go to a cat scale where you've got the different platforms, put the front truck tires on the first platform, put the uh, second tires, the drive tires on the second platform, and put your fifth wheel tow hauler on the last platform and see what your gross axle weight rating is of each place of that. And, you know, I, I typically don't recommend anybody put um, lots of water in the tanks just because of weight distribution, 8.6 8 pounds per gallon. You know, you can put 800 plus pounds um, in this stuff. But if you, if you have too light of a front end and the heavier back end, and you have the weight to do it. You know, you're not going over GVWR. You're not going over gross axle weight rating back there. But that's the big thing. If you're going over gross axle weight rating, you got to move something forward. You know, and, and typically you can't move your your toy much more forward. So what can I take out of that back end and and move it up towards the front? And again, sometimes you'll see where a manufacturer builds a unit, and you you've got an axle weight rating of X amount that goes on there and you put your toy in and it goes over the top of it, they don't know what you're putting in. And a lot of times, you know, what can go in there is not always going to stay under gross axle weight rating. So those are the things you got to get in and weigh it, find out what your numbers are. Then you should be able to figure out, do I need to shift something around? Um, Chip says, what are some ways to tie into the power sources when adding LED underbelly lights to a class A? Um, so what he wants to do is you got these string lights that go on under, underneath the bottom portion of, of the chassis and, um, illuminate the ground underneath it. So they're, they're going to run off a 12 volt source. So the best thing I could recommend is the, I, I would typically, if you can get to the distribution center, like we said before, you, you could put in a dedicated line that would go into one of these that is not being used. You know, you've got quite a few circuits in here that you could you could add to and then ground it. 
or you can go directly to the battery. And, and I would not ground to the chassis anywhere. I would run a dedicated line with positive and negative. Some people will come in and run just one line into a distribution center or into a, um, a battery and then ground, take the ground wire and go to the chassis. And in the theory that your, your engine, excuse me, your house battery is in its compartment and one of the, um, one of the ground wires goes to the chassis and provides chassis ground throughout. But you got so many gremlins, you got so many welds. Most of them are running dedicated lines from the distribution center to whatever components going in there. So that I, I would recommend doing that. <clears throat> what is the best water pump for pressure and quality? I think we talked about that with the uh, SureFlow. Um, you know, again, this is just, just in case. 424, so I think uh, I think that one, we covered that one. Anyway, sure flow, I like that, at least three gallons per minute. Uh, Flowjet is another one that's out there. And Carrie says, this is great, thank you. Well, Carrie, you're welcome. I appreciate you coming out, and uh, it's, it's always a very, uh, very enlightening to be able to help out with questions and then hit a couple stumpers that I have to go research and find out uh, those, are, those are the challenging ones that, that keep me motivated. It's like I say, you get up and you went, really? I have never heard of that. Okay. Um, would you add electric brakes to a tow dolly for a small Buick SUV behind 2019 Georgetown 36? And he puts, it's got 36 inch gas. Now, if it was a 36 inch Georgetown, I don't think, I, <laughs> yes, I would definitely do it. 36 feet, but um and, and I, would, I would definitely put supplemental brakes. So you put electric brakes in here, but uh, both Blue Ox and Roadmaster have a supplemental braking system that is a box basically that sits in the floorboard of the driver's seat and pushes on the pedal, and it gyros as, as, you, as you apply the brake. So it's not an all-on like some of them are that's going to skid your tires. And I like both of those systems. They've been around for years and years. Uh, one of the things, anything over 1,500 pounds being towed behind it, I, I, am a, um, I am an advocate for supplemental brakes. There are several states around the United States, that, that, and there are road use laws, and um, we used to have a copy of them that they've changed, so we're trying to update that. But like Iowa, anything over 4,000 pounds has to have supplemental brakes. In New Jersey, anything over 1,500 pounds. So I, I don't think it's harder to stop in New Jersey than it is in Iowa, but they all have different road use laws. And, and to keep yourself protected from being stopped by a DOT officer and getting a citation for not having supplemental brakes on something that their state has, um, to me, it's a good idea. And not just, not just because of the law, but because of trying to not have weight pushing your motor home when you're going down a hill, when you're in um, rainy weather, wet pavement, uh, mountain driving, that type of stuff. Any kind of supplemental brake that can help slow that vehicle down there to not push weight on you, I, I think is important. And, uh, you know, with that unit you've got, you said it was an SUV, a Buick SUV. So I, I would say you're probably at least up into above 3,000, probably 3,600 pounds. Um, and, and you go, go weigh it again. That's another thing you can do at a cat scale. You can go to Flying J's Pilots. If you go to catscale.com, you'll find them all over the country and they're 10 bucks. Good thing to do. Can you recommend a high quality tire pressure gauge? And I, um, I don't have a brand name that I, that I like um, other than the fact that I, I go to the Pilots, the Flying J's. Um, I've got a local place here that sells truck supplies and they have a certification program. So I can buy a really good tire pressure monitor, the nice big long one. I don't think I have one here with me and I actually got it out in the shop. But, um, you know, two things I look for in a tire pressure is number one, by a, by a, a quality uh, supplier that can certify it. I can take it back and I can certify it. And number two, that it's got the ad adaptable tip. And I don't mean adaptable as much as two different types of, of filling tips so I can get it into the wheels that I want. You know, take a look at what your valve stem comes out, how you need to put, you know, test that. 
and make sure that if you've got a, a dual on the inside that's tough to get to, does it have the backwards one that you can get in and be able to get on? So, you know, there's a couple different things that I, that I look at. But if you can find a tire um, or a truck specialty place, and ours happens to be uh, Midwest Wheels here in Clear Lake, Iowa, um, but any place that supplies your, your major trucking firms around, they will have a good one. And it was only 1995. Uh, I was very surprised at the, at the price, and it's a it's a great it's a great tire um, pressure monitor. Um, or, excuse me, tire pressure gauge monitor is a little different system. Uh, AC says I have a 2005 Fleetwood Providence. I purchased a portable electric fireplace. After I plugged the fireplace in and let it run a while, I checked the plug, uh, and it and the cable were hot, and the socket head turned brown. What could I have done wrong? Uh, you are overloading that system. You know, you, you probably don't have the proper gauge uh, wire for that. You need to look at what kind of um, draw that's coming off that electric fireplace. Those draw a lot of amps. Um, you start putting that onto, uh, um, you know, like a, a 14 gauge wire or or even 16. You know, I don't think you'd go 16, but, you know, you, you've got to have the proper gauge to, mac to match the amp draw you have and the distance that you're going. And you also have to look at that, that uh, plug-in, the outlet that you're doing. If that turned brown, then it, it, it's getting too hot. It's drawing too many amps for, for what the wiring you got and for that, that gauge. And typically in RVs, you see most manufacturers, especially now when they're building them in as fast as they can, they can't get them out the door. They're looking for any way possible to cheapen that down to make more money. And I don't want to be a consumer advocate, but I see it all the time. They're going to go with the lowest gauge wiring that they can get by with by RVIA standards. Now, our RVIA does come in and set standards that say you have to have this for this and this. And, and they do adhere to that. But if you didn't have a fireplace in it to begin with, they don't have to have that wiring in there. So you need to look at what kind of draw you have, the wiring that's in there, and the wiring that's in that outlet. And if that out, <clears throat> excuse me. And if that outlet is ganged to other ones, that could be uh, something too, that it, it's got your one switch we talked about or one connection, but it goes to this outlet and then it goes to this outlet and then this outlet. So you do that and now you're spreading that and you're, you're, you're slicing all that uh, available amperage up and it's, it, you're going to have a problem. And I would definitely not use this thing until you get that looked at because you, you could have a fire. So that's something that's very important. Um... Right, 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 right. Okay, our walkthrough inspection on our 2021 Road Trek Zion Class B is in two weeks. As newbies to RV camping, should we hire a professional RV inspector and get a full report before we have we take possession of this van? Um, okay, and, and this is kind of a interesting situation when you say, can we, should we hire a professional RV inspector and you know, the, the first thing I would ask is, who are you buying this from? If you're buying it from a private party, then I would definitely get somebody that is familiar with RVs. Um, you know, the, the only certification for RV inspectors that's out in the market is the RV Inspection Academy. Uh, and it's down out of Texas. I can't remember if that's, if that's right. Um, that is a private individual that has, he was a certified RVIA certified mechanic. He's brought in his own kind of training and he's put this inspection thing together to certify these people. It is not it's something that is certified by RVIA, um, who does the, the, uh, training for certified RVIA technicians. Although I do think it, it is a step in the right direction and I'm not discounting what he does. I haven't been through the class. I don't, I don't know anything about it. But, um, you know, it, it, it's better than not getting it inspected. So I would definitely find an inspector, ask the questions what they're looking for. Now, your Class B is going to have a lot less, um, you know, inspection points than you would when you start looking at a diesel pusher and some of the bigger Class A's that are out there or toy haulers. But it's still important. I would say if you're buying from a private individual, I would definitely get somebody inspected and make that part of the buying process. If you're buying from a dealer, then I would say, I want a detailed report. I want to know, is, is that person that's doing the walk around, I want to report on it. 
and did they check for leaks and how did they do it? Did they do a seal tech check? So I know there's no leak. Did they run all the appliances? Do I, do I have a certification that the refrigerator um, is going gonna, is gonna to work for six months? Because if you've got a block cooling unit in an absorption refrigerator, I'm not sure which this one has, but you won't know it until it gets up into 90 to 100 degree temperature. They all work at 60. So I would, I would ask for verification of who's doing the inspection at your dealership. Um, and, and a detailed report of what's going out there. Otherwise, I would definitely find an RV, uh, RV mechanic that's an RVIA certified technician and is familiar with inspection. So. <clears throat> okay. Uh, what is the advantage of having four 6-volt batteries and, or two 12-volt batteries? Dave Johnson, um, and he's an 05 Keystone Travel Trailer. So there, there's, yeah, it's kind of the Ford versus Chevy uh, type of argument at points. Winnebago puts in two 12-volt batteries, and they do that because the 12-volt is um, a little bit less maintenance in their opinion. They're easier to find out on the road. Um, the 6-volt batteries, they, they, they take, um, you know, the converter, and let's, let's go back to step back one a little bit. Six volt batteries are what you find in golf carts and various things like that, and they still make a 12 volt bank. So you take two six volt batteries and you hook them positive to negative. That gives you a 12 volt bank in, in there. So you have to have two or four or six. You can't have just one or three. So that gives you 12 volts and it gives you whatever that amp rating is for that battery. If it's a group 24, it's about 100. If it's a group 27, it's going to be a little more than that. Putting those two together did not double your amp hours. So you want to double your amp hours. You have to go to four of the six-volt batteries. So that's where your question is. So really, you have two 12-volt banks. I can get the exact same amp hours in two 12-volt batteries that are rated at the same amp hours. Now, the advantage of the six-volt battery is that it will last longer meaning more cycles. So every time I drain it down 50%, bring it back up, drain it down 50%, bring it back up. So you're cycling this thing. And with the six volt battery, you have more plates, more cells, more cycles. So it should last you a lot longer down the road if, if you take care of it. So you have to decide how much are you going to be dry camping um, versus that. <clears throat> and, um, you know, so you can get by with a, the with a 12 volt if you first of all get the right amp hours and, and you're comparing the two and you get a, a good battery and you condition it properly. We talked about sulfation sulfation before that, and so both of them are susceptible to that. And we're talking lead acid batteries in this case. So that that's kind of the you know Winne, Winnebago's philosophy was that the when you charge the six volt batteries, they, they gas more, the water level goes down, and most people don't check their battery level. So now you've just negated what would have been an advantage for that because when you let it go down, it sulfates. And their theory is that the 12 volt will work just as well if you maintain them properly. Okay. So we are about one minute left. We've got a couple, quite a few more questions here, but. Let me get to Richard. We just purchased a used fifth wheel trailer. The dealer added a new LED light strip under the awning. I saw it work properly at the dealership and was bright. Now that I have it home, the lights are very dim. It came with a remote. I've tried all the buttons on the remote, but it's still dim. You think it's a loose electrical connection. It could be one of two things. First of all, it could be a ground wire that is just not, you know, not quite uh, secured properly. But my thought is that probably your house batteries are starting, they're sulfated, they're starting to get dim. Does it do it when it's plugged in? Here's another thing to try. Go and plug in a battery charger and put on your house batteries, which I'm assuming this light strip is hooked to. If all of a sudden it comes up, then it's your batteries. That's, that's what's causing it. More times than not, when something either runs slow or is dim like that, you, know, you, you go back to the batteries and the ground. Dennis asks, I'm a 1988 beaver. <laughs> I'm trying to find where the freshwater pipe goes to, to the freshwater tank. And uh, it's in the pond. No. Uh, 
where the freshwater pipe goes into the freshwater tank. So I think what you're looking at is the gravity fill on the side of the tank, or excuse me, the side of your RV, you should have either a door or a recessed area where you can put a garden hose in and run the fresh water in, and that should fill your tank. And that should be very, very close with just a straight down. Most of your tanks have the inlet to the, in, to the side, three quarters of the way up or even a little higher um, on, the, on the side of the freshwater tank itself. Some of them do the top, but usually that, that freshwater tank is right up close to where that floor line is at, and then with a little vent tube on it. So, um, it, it, you know, in 1988, the challenge you're going to have with that is there, there's probably no documentation left uh, for that. So we are over the time now. We're going to have to wrap it up. Um, and I do know that the, uh, I do, I see Keith just said Ford chassis, air conditioning, but the air conditioning system is pro air. Uh, so the, again, we talked about that a little bit earlier that, uh, warms up blower speed. So I think you're going to have to get in touch with your motorhome company that that is going to be part of their system. So with that, again, don't forget we have the RV money saving secrets download on uh, uh, where to get uh, uh, cheaper gas, um, meal planning, free campsites, a whole host of secrets you can download off our website. We'll see you again next month and have a great, great uh, spring here. The, hopefully the weather allows you to get your RVs out and start getting them ready to take some camping trips. And uh, one thing, just a quick tip is make your reservations early because the campgrounds are filling up like crazy. So thanks for joining us. We appreciate it.